Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled How AI is Reshaping Lending in Asia Pacific. For uh, Special thanks to the speakers for taking the time to share their views with us and Mobawala for sponsoring this webinar. Now, for the past decade, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and big data have been the centerpiece of the conversation when it comes to modernizing financial services. And I think one area in which the use of AI is prevalent is in the lending space, from driving efficiencies to enabling more uh, inclusive finance. We are seeing more and more FSI adopting the use of AI. However, the use of AI is not without its downsides or the risk of biases. So joining us today to discuss the state of AI in lending are uh, right on top there, we have Aninya Data, who is the founder, CEO, and chairman of Mobawala. Below Aninya is Do Dr. David Hadun, who is the chief data and AI officer for the Union Bank of the Philippines. Uh, below David is Jerry Ying. Jerry Ying is the chief product officer in Asia Pacific for TransUnion. And below Jerry, we have Ishan. Ishan is the chief group chief technology officer for funding societies, also known as Modalku, uh, to our Indonesian friends who's tuning in today. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. So maybe we can start the conversation uh, with Anindya on top there. And uh, maybe you can paint us a picture uh, in terms of the adoption of AI and FSI in Asia. Um, Talk to walk us through how sophisticated it is right now. How how are financial services organization in Asia utilizing AI right now in lending? Hey Vincent, nice nice hey. to be nice to be with you again. And Welcome for, back. For a change, I'm not doing it at like midnight from the US. <laughs> so uh, and, and 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 hello to everyone else. Uh, <clears throat> just you know um, the obligatory few words about Mobilewala. You know Mobilewala is a company where we effectively provide data and features that drive uh, better modeling performance, right? Just to make sure we are not, not just a fintech data provider. We provide data to, you know, for instance, you know, ride share companies and telecom companies. But a very significant part of our business is uh, providing features that drives AI at, uh, at fintech companies. And I'll just, you know, in answer to uh, Vincent's question, and I'm sure my fellow panelists will have much to say here as well. You know, in very short, um, uh, in lending, effectively, I mean, it's a tautology that really what you're trying to find out is that, hey, should I lend to this 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 person? And um, effectively, the person doesn't return the money, and that's not a good thing. Um, and 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 virtually all of decision making or a major part of decision making in lending. Is, is around figuring out how likely is this person to pay me back um, and pay me back on time, actually, right? So, so in, in, um, in economies where, you know, credit bureaus have been around providing stuff for a long time to do this, the thing in, you know, the, 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 coup, you know, the, the problem, the reason it becomes interesting in emerging markets uh, such as Asia Pacific is because the credit bureau's uh, footprint uh, is, is, is small, right? So there'll be people who come to you who don't have traditional uh, credit score. So there, you know, uh, I would say that that in terms of technology adoption, AI and machine learning are probably one of the, 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 the biggest adopted sort of framework technologies in fintech. Mm -hmm. And people are using it to effectively do credit worthiness. And, and I'm not going to, you know, I'm sure we'll go into more detail in, you know, and, and effectively, it's about, hey, how likely is this person to pay me back? And there are a bunch of sort of smaller things that, that, that can, for instance, you know, um, if, if somebody is untruthful about where they live, it turns out that they're a risky proposition, right? So, so, so hey, is this person truthful about information this person is disclosing? Uh, mm -hmm. Is this person, you know, uh, uh, based on, 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 on what I know about this person, how likely, how credit worthy this person, you know, credit risk uh, modeling, uh, you know, uh, veracity, what, what we call veracity modeling, right? So somebody says something, how likely this person is true. There are a bunch of sort of individual things that fintechs do, but it's it's all, you know, and 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 and, and we have, you know, in, in I, I should be very clear that that mobile has experience and my experience is in is in offering data and features to sort of what are known as fintech companies, you know, not, not a large number of traditional banks, 
because traditional, you know, fintech companies exist because traditional banks generally don't make these kind of loans. But yeah, so that's 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 the high level. That's what it is. Yeah, I think of course one of the most um, immediate use cases we can see is in credit scoring, particularly in parts of Asia Pacific where, like you say, credit bureau is not largely available. Right. I think uh, David could also speak to that uh, in in Philippines where there's still a lot of blind spots when it comes to data as well. Uh, maybe we can have David next. David, paint us a picture of how sophisticated are the usage of AI in, in Asia and, and in particular maybe you could also walk us through some of the ways that Union Bank is, is leveraging AI in lending as well. Well first and foremost thank thank you thank you very much for having me here. It's always a pleasure and welcome back. talking about these. Thank you very much. It's always good to be back. So maybe not dwelling too much in terms of the sophistication because I think one has to always contextualize it. Um, both from a geographic perspective as well as from a readiness point of view. But I, I want to kind of build on the construct of not just finance, but, but lending, is that in the end of the day, it is about the oversimplification of taking money or giving money, essentially. So, so lending fundamentally doesn't change. But where you think about sophistication of lending and also where we, as I believe many others, are going to is how do we make it more relevant? Now, and what does relevant mean? And this is an area whereby I think there's a lot of emphasis for be it features, for the usage of AI, you just other techniques and capabilities, which really kicks in. Now, in the end of the day, as a financial institution, we want to lend. On the other hand, we want to make sure that we're lending responsibly. Also, this is another parameterization that's, I think, a lot more, it's always been there, but I think it's a lot more acutely um, focused on from a fiduciary responsibility, from a governance. We've seen what's been happening specifically in the field of kind of AI with respect to um, ethical considerations associated. Are we lending responsibly? Are we doing within the remits of what's, what, what, what uh, borrowers can actually manage and so forth? So that's a whole pillar associated within it. And then thirdly, is this realization is that uh, unlike uh, Voldemort, it, or, actually, or, or actually a lot of the rings, it's not one one platform or one system or one approach, I should more say, for lending that will rule them all. It's the realization of we're dealing with very different underlying cohorts of individuals with varying degrees of circumstances, necessities. So how do we now take that and contextualize it? So circling back to your first question is, I think still think this is quite of a runway to go if due to the maturity that's coming to play. But what we are finding and what organizations such as ourselves and how we're approaching it is exactly that. We're taking the principles of hyper-personalization. You know, the, the, if I can abuse the term, the, the holy grail of, you know, segment of one of really, really understanding the specific customer in terms of a behavioral perspective from, not from an ability of repayment, but also from the ability in terms of capacity and necessity. What is it that you truly need? You may come in and say, oh, I want a, 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 a load of, whatever it may be from 500 pesos to a million pesos or 10 million pesos because you know that's what it says on the tin or you're thinking i'm just going to maximize what i could potentially draw on. but is it is it tailored around the necessity what is it that you're trying to do with it what you're trying to achieve with it so kind of understanding the usage and the what we kind of call moments of life associated around that then secondly this is where it becomes really important is because that's inability or process of collection and making sure that we, 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 we do lend responsibly and collection happens is very tacked to that point of making sure that it's within the premise of what someone can do. So it could be a scenario that actually for someone it is a traditional large scale, you know, in the traditional sense of, you know, here's a chunk of money, here's 12 months or two years or five years, you know, the, the, the more preferable approach of financial institutions of, you know, shoot and forget to a much more high volatility kind of touch point, kind of saying like, here are smaller chunks of money, which is less of a loaning point of view, but more from a credit management perspective. So that's kind of from a usage point of view, from an operationalization perspective, how we're thinking about it and how what you're finding in terms of, a, 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 I guess, usage of an AI point of view, which is kind of being done, I think, across the region, effectively. A lot of... Um strong teams that you brought up there from hyper personalization personalization to the collection of data lending responsibly ethically a lot of things that i think we can dive a lot deeper into as we go along with this session thank you for sharing your views david uh moving along to jerry now jerry you know transunion you guys put out a lot of 
very good reports which we follow very closely as well particularly in the credit space and whatnot uh what insights can you share with us about the use of ai in, in lending in asia yeah thank you for having me uh this time uh, and and i think i think um in terms of TransUnion, we, we are actually one of the top three bureaus that really cover many footprint in different parts of the world. Um, I myself actually managing both the Hong Kong and Philippines. Uh, where Hong Kong, we have a very mature market at looking at 85% coverage. Like what some of the colleagues are saying is that in Philippines, we only got like somewhere around 25%. And, 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 and the needs of AI is actually very important on how to compensate the coverage of the consumer uh, where some of the new to credit segment are not able to get lending and how do we make use of AI to do it. And I think this is where we actually have started uh, like last year that we actually launching uh, what we call kind of the, the CB link score, which is a new to credit score that we work with a uh, 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 telco partner where we actually make use of the uh, telcos uh, information and score to um, look at based on prepay or top up behavior to, to really uh, try to come up with a score that actually helps on lending. So where we, rather than covering around 25 million of the population, now we can probably look at around 70, 80 million population of Philippines. I think that's where the, the improvement of that. And obviously one of the challenge we see is that because this kind of new to credit score is, is a way that we look at is initial score only. You don't, still don't have a lot of information about the behavior. And that's ex exactly how um, TU is also trying to help is that how do we actually continue monitor and work with our uh, digital player, whether it's FinTech or, or banks in uh, sharing these new to customer segments, uh, especially in a more real time, for example, some of the buy now, pay later, player that they now looking for more real time access, right? I think these are some of the direction that we are moving into to ensure that we are able to, to maximize that. And obviously it also becoming one of the big decision for, for some of the banks or lender is that they have the capital, they want to optimize the use for lending, whether it's, it's actually more focusing on their fixed segment or they want to develop a market with them. New, new to market segment. I think these are some of the, the support that we are trying to uh, create, uh, especially with the AI and also the data collection capability to, to really support well. Thanks, okay. Jerry. Interesting to see the credit bureaus also moving into alternate data as well. Um, do you guys also work with uh, you know intelligence platforms, fintechs like MobileWala to kind of enrich your data as well? Or what, what are your sources of data these days? Yeah, um, well, some of the market that we actually starting to do is actually to, in, in, to integrate uh, open banking, for example, mm -hmm. in UK. And then while we also starting to look at in Hong Kong, uh, where mm -hmm. with the consent based access, we, we do look at how to access um, um, CASA inquiry data, where we actually make use of AI to interpret the inquiry transactions and then really interpret things like uh, what is the kind of the cash flow and income level for the for the individuals mm -hmm. and, and as well as some of the uh, um, uh, 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 employment or or address verification through through the access so that we can validate a person rather than you uploading an address proof or income proof because where you can actually fake the document but while with the open mm -hmm. banking with the other data source using AI to interpret it, I think that is one of the direction that we are seeing as well on, on, on that. Cool. Thank you very much, Jerry. And Sorry, Vincent, and, uh, yes, uh, go ahead. Vincent, I should add that, of course, TransUnion is one of our favorite customers. So we don't, <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> we don't work with Jerry, but we work with both the India team and the US team. <laughs> Oh, I see. I guess you and Jerry should talk more for yeah. Asia-related stuff. Yeah. Um, moving on. Thanks for that, Aninia, for for that context. Moving along to Ishan. Ishan. Um. I mean, you are representing the fintech of the the, the, the lending space over here in this panel, right? Walk us through um, what you've observed within fintech startups, whether the use of AI is uh, prevalent, and and talk to us about how you're using it in funding societies as well. Sure. Thanks, first of all, thanks, Vincent, uh, for inviting me to this panel. And thanks, everyone, for dialing in uh, this morning to listen to us. Um, so I think uh, actually a lot of it is already covered, right? Uh, 
in a way, the way different fintechs and financial institutions are trying to solve this problem in Southeast Asia is reflective of the market. Uh, Southeast Asia is not like a China or India or a US where there's a deep market with deep enough data penetration, uh, but it's a fragmented market where you know each of the country is a little bit different. The data availability is a little bit different. Um, so, so the the way we the way we as a fintech are trying to solve this problem in each market is also a little bit different, right? And mm-hmm. and it's also different to like other more mature markets. Uh, I think secondly, it it uh, I think another point that maybe I'll elaborate on a little bit more is that I think we, we largely covered the, the, the credit scoring side of things, uh, but AI actually plays a role in all steps of a lending life cycle, right? Mm. So from an acquisition perspective where, you know, we are looking at propensity models of intent and ability uh, to application where we're looking at real time scoring, uh, where instead of exposing our complexity, like, hey, you apply for a product ABC, we're trying to understand the customer better um, and then offer the best products possible. Then you're looking at things like EKYC, which is so, uh, in a way, normal for us now that, hey, you take a selfie and you 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 know you, you, you have ID. We, we are doing that across all fintech platforms. But that's essentially an application of AI as well. Uh, fraud detection around identity theft, bot detections, device fraud, like, you know, multiple aspects of that are all applications of AI. Underwriting, of course, is like the, the biggest beast here, which is like the core of any lending platform. And I think collections is also an important aspect where we are looking at uh, conversion triggers uh, and even like sort of automated follow ups uh, in a lot of different cases, which is vastly reduce uh, or rather increased operational efficiency. Um, so, so I think AI really has applications all across the lending side, life cycle. Mm. Uh, of course, the biggest being on the credit scoring side. <laughs> of course. Uh, I'm just curious though, because if you compare uh, Funding Society's business model versus your conventional banks, of course, um, you cast largely a, a wider net of uh, SMEs that the conventional banks may not target, right? So, uh, do you find that because you target the more underserved SMEs that the need to use AI for credit scoring is even more important? And also the other thing is that your retail investors keep a close eye on your NPLs, right? So that that also factors into it as well. Uh, is it more yeah. important than how so? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Actually, you put it very well, Vincent. So uh, because we are looking at a wider range and perhaps... Mm. Uh, you know, the, the underserved segment, uh, data availability is even worse, right? Because the segment mm. is actually not as not covered as well in the uh, traditional ecosystem. Uh, so the, the only way for us to kind of really mm. do this, uh, you know, be able to kind of reach out to SMEs, lend to SMEs and do that really, really fast at good rates is by using a lot of different kinds of data sources. Uh, and and coming up with models on that, mm. uh, and thankfully I think we've we've been doing that pretty well. Like our, our our NPLs have been very very low across you know for the past seven years that we've been in business for, uh, and as you said, like we it's not just institutional investors, but we also have retail investors. So we're very transparent about mm. some of these things. If you you can actually go to our websites and there's a public status uh, statistics page where you can actually look at some of these things. So it. For us, it's essential, right? I, I don't mm. think we can exist without it. And I think it, hopefully um, Aninja and Jerry can work closer together to fix some of this data availability problem in Asia, right? <laughs> I think that would we be quite that. core. Yeah, thanks for that, Aisha. Now let's move on to um, the next team. I think earlier, uh, David, you brought up about the uh, ethical use of AI. You talk about uh, responsible lending um, I think one of the things that happens when it comes to using AI in credit modeling is that we do inevitably see some biases, right? And I think one of the uh, popular examples was, um, I think when Apple launched their credit card in US and um, a a couple who has similar earning profile, similar credit uh, profile, what happened was the the wife had had, uh, 
worse interest rate compared to the husband, if I'm not mistaken. So there were clearly some issues with the data modeling over there. So I was just wondering, like, how extensive is the risk of uh, bias when it comes to using AI for credit scoring? Yeah, no, it's, thanks. Thanks for the question. Let me start off actually by, um, uh, I think when it was that part of the story, there was a lot of focus, but mm -hmm. what didn't actually get, uh, I think, I don't think communicated quite broadly is actually in the US, it is not allowed by financial institutions to collect or use uh, gender related information. So mm. yes, there may have been issues with the model, but it had nothing to do with the gender because the, gen the model was actually blind to gender. I so I, I wanted to start with that because I think that is what we need to be focusing on. Mm -hmm. To me, when I hear the word bias, there's nothing wrong with bias. Uh, and I, I'll repeat that again, there's absolutely nothing wrong with bias. Every decision has a bias. The ability to lend is based on bias. It's the construct of the bias which is important. Is it one which is based on factual information or is it one which is a, 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 um, a disadvantageous one, essentially with respect to uh, incorrect parameterization, such as the one that we all know about? So, so we have to separate those two. So when we go about, it's very critical, and this is where, and thankfully, you know, all regulators have these requirements. If you look at traditional credit risk, risk uh, credit risk uh, related scoring models for model validation, uh, robustness, stability, the same type of principle principles must apply on any non-traditional credit risk uh, based models. Uh, I, and this is something which I strongly believe, whether you're a regulated entity or a non-regulated entity, that is simply hygiene and due diligence that needs to put in place. And that will give any person or builder or lender the confidence that their models are stable. So going back to, to your analogy, um, essentially, Vincent. Then the second question is, it is less per se on the modeling. It is more questions of the operationalization of that model. Meaning we still have a, a, a responsibility from a process perspective to make sure is there any harm that may be occurring from it? Is there any mistakes? Is there review? That's that's a process element. So in other words, you can have a perfectly um, correct model, but it is used in an incorrect manner. Or you can have a perfectly incorrect model, but because of those controls in place, it is used in a correct manner. I mean, obviously, at the end of the day, it gets thrown away. So that essentially is what we do. What I believe with a lot of these um, principles and guidelines that's been coming up in, in the region, if not globally, others have been doing, where it's really a realization that it's the combination of the two. Assurance to the extent that is possible on the stability of models and data that's being used. We need to know what we're dealing with. And secondly is the operationalization component of what happens here. And, and by the way, if, if I may just slightly extend my response, this is also why I, I highlighted my first point, the criticality of the hyper-personalization problem and realizing that one there's no one ring to rule them all. These type of, of seemingly unfair uh, uh, lending coming for models usually occurs is because a model is built and it fits itself to a certain group of behavior. Therefore, statistically ignoring or sidetracking other types of behavior because of one reason or another. From a practice perspective, it may mean essentially, well, it just means we have to have more models or more specificity that is related to those groups effectively. So essentially, in other words, I may have to decline you for this loan, Vincent, I'm really sorry about that, but I have another model, different product, different specialization that I can actually provide you at a different construct and making sure that it is being inclusive effectively. So I just want to emphasize point, no, not one ring to rule the role, taking a more parcellated, more modular approach, realization of tech and combination of people essentially. Thank you for that, David. And I think um, you've helped me to redefine the word bias. I mean, I've always viewed it as a you know, negative kind of word, right? But I guess in, in, in all our constructs, there are biases. It's just whether the biases are correct, as you have pointed out. Um, let's move. Thanks for that, David. Let's move on to Aninya. Um, do you have any insights on how uh, AI may have the incorrect biases in, in terms of how we model it? Yeah, so I, I, you know, David made some very good points, sort of mm. on the macro impact of bias. Let me let me give you, you know, since this is a chat about AI, if we can get a little nerdy, so let's let me give you <laughs> let's nerd it out. 
practical impact of you know so so in 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 machine learning in ai you know bias is a very specific meaning now i'm not no longer talking about bias in the sense that hey am i uh, skewing lending towards a particular section in a particular ethnic group blah blah it's not that right so all you know all ai as uh, you know at the end a model says that hey these are the criteria that lead up to whatever score you're going to use or whatever decision you're going to make. And you say, okay, criteria A, criteria B, criteria C, with some weightage, you know, roughly at a very high level is what you should look at. What happens is that once you apply that model again and again, because it's continuously operating and the feedback comes back, you know, something that occurs very often is something called, you know, and this feedback loop, right? I mean, you run the model, you see what happens, you update the model. You run the model, see what happens, you update the model. In this feedback loop, sometimes what happens is something called a degenerate feedback loop for no reason at all. Certain criteria just get overweighted, right? So for instance, you start off a model saying that people who live in West Jakarta and you know people that shop at, I don't know, some store, lend to them or give them a high score. I'm just making a weird example. And, and, you know, and maybe you start off by both of these having almost equal weightage, right? Something is 52%, 48%. After the model has operated 10 times, you know, these weights can get very skewed. And, and what, what happens is that then sort of something very practically bad happens, which, which, you know, we work with a bunch of different folks like Isham, where the model can't even produce any more output because you've run out of people in West Jakarta because, you know, West Jakarta is so highly valued now. You only... You know, you, at the expense of everything else, you start looking for, you know, it's called, it's called basically outcome starvation, right? So it's bias is not just this sort of this, this, this great problem of, as, as David said, this very sort of, you know, societal, hey, I'm, 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 uh, but bias has very practical reasons that make, that effectively you can't run your business anymore. Because you know, if you're using, for instance, like uh, Ishan was saying, you're using AI to acquire and you have created your acquisition model, eventually bias becomes such that you, the model doesn't throw off enough candidates for you to go acquire, right? So, so there's some very, very, so I, I, anyway, for those of you who are really nerdy, sort of we wrote, I wrote an article on this in Towards Data Science, like, I don't know, four or five months ago on this exact same issue with credit as an example, right? So I'm going to put that in the, in the chat, uh, Vincent, you can send it out to the crowd if you like. Yeah, so, sure. so, so bias is very insidious, very insidious, very subtle, but eventually very debilitating effects on practical aspects of how, how, how model impacts your business. Sure, we could also, uh, we normally do a summary article. We can include a link to that to uh, let the readers who want to find out more. Yeah, this link explicitly talks about model bias and, and, and in lending and how it, how it impacts. Yeah. No, I think it is fascinating because we are seeing a lot of people using location data and, and you're right about the weightage and whatnot, right? Thanks for that, Aninya. Um, Jerry, Ishan, anything to add about the um, conversation about uh, biases? Yeah, I think I, I get to ask. Yeah, Jerry? I get to ask a lot by, by our clients. Mm. Uh, why, why should I trust your new to credit score, well, our mm. CB link score, right? Uh, obviously, um, anything new is always have have people have doubt, and 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 especially I think being a bureau, I think we, we have the advantage that we are working with members and they are sharing back the data that including the new to credit segment, and then we do have some new to credit segment can, that can actually validate if I'm using telco data for the score, how good is the score, and what mm. is the case, and what is the genie, and how. How, how how trustable of, of the score we, we can believe in. I think that's where we are actually creating that sort of what we call the feedback loop, the data analysis, as mm -hmm. well as what we call back testing. So some of the clients who, who want to understand, okay, if I want to go into this space on, on new to credit, if I try to do it, some of them are may already doing it, but they they just not aware of it because they 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 they, they offer loan to the, to those people. Mm -hmm. But these information can be used in combination of the traditional credit data to actually help link fence the whole uh, credit decision so that we are able to actually do it more accurately and, and, and more precisely, right? 
Um, the other example, actually, we also do um, is, is the EKYC. We, we actually uh, work in multiple markets, especially in Hong Kong. We have a very stringent uh, uh, document authentication with uh, forensic um, uh, some of the security feature within the, the document. And, and, and we actually need to train the AI model to do it. And we actually need to spend a lot, lot of time to, to look at manually uh, look at the, the quality of the AI engine and try to create a feedback loop mechanism so that we can continue to improve. And obviously there's no perfect system. And then and, and what we also see in that example on the EKY mm -hmm. is that we need to look at multiple layer of authentication based on maybe credit bureau data by checking uh, a device as well as some of the phone and ID information on top of the document authentication so that we actually can 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 really cover a, a multi-layer uh, security risk control point of view to, to to ensure we are doing it properly and, and, and correctly I think that that's how we preventing the what we call the whole bias uh, mechanism uh, in, in the AI thanks for that Jerry and um, you know it's it's a good insight into how transunion uh, models their data and um, you did bring up eKYC and I think some of the audience member also wanted to talk a little bit about fraud and, and whatnot. So we'll dive a little bit into that later. But uh, before we do that, Ishan, do you have anything to add um, to this particular conversation about biases? Yeah, I think I think this is a very interesting part of AI, yeah. right? And it, uh, it shows across all applications of AI. Uh, like even when you're looking at image recognition, uh, a lot of the models traditionally were trained on a certain data set uh, and, you know, they did not work as well on, let's say, like an Asian data set, right? So over time, we've seen this come up again and again in different uh, aspects of AI. Uh, and I think largely there's two aspects to it. One is the data set itself, and second is the model, right? So on the data set side, uh, the data you're, you're collecting, like, you know, whether uh, you're, you're collecting in your particular data set that you have, you may have, uh, you know, a certain race or a certain gender defaulting much more than the actual data set, right? And this is true for any kind of statistics problem. Uh, uh, the, the kind of data set you collect uh, will determine, you know, the biases that your result will have. Uh, there's also an aspect of, uh, like, for instance, you may strip out gender and certain regulators required, like as, as David mentioned, US has a regulation on it. MAS has a guideline. Uh, on fair use of AI as well. Um, you can strip out like explicitly certain characteristics, but they may implicitly still show from other aspects of the data. So if you're collecting enough data, you can, uh, there, there can be proxies for things like gender or race that may show up indirectly. And you may not even be aware of it, depending upon the kind of models that you're using. So that's the model part where uh, they're, has to be more explainability as well as audibility, auditability of models. Um, and certain models which are more complex uh, do not allow that. So I think that's another thing that uh, lending companies or fintech companies have to be very cautious of, of what kind of models uh, they're using. Um, and you have to pick the right goals for your model as well. Um, one of the interesting uh, sort of, I, I was going through a paper on it and, and one of the interesting approaches that uh, they took was they introduced uh, adversarial AI uh, while training it, right? So that, that particular AI would actually look out for cases uh, where um, a discriminatory result uh, was, was, uh, was being made on a, on a mortgage uh, lending data set. And then, then it would explicitly go back and improve the data set. So in a way, it, it became like part, they used AI to kind of retrain the data set or, or improve the data set uh, to be able to reduce biases in, in their result. Uh, so yeah, I think largely in my view, it comes back to like the kind of data set you're picking uh, and how you can uh, optimize that better and the models that you're using for uh, running, uh, running any kind of analysis. And in this case, credit scoring specifically. Fascinating. So you're using AI to train AI for biases. Feeling a little bit Skynet, but uh, <laughs> it's all good. Instantly, you know, you, sure, yeah, go ahead, David. 
Yeah, no, no, I just want to jump in for a second because just to, sure. and, and not to go into um, sociological or borderline uh, theological constructs, but I think this goes back to what I mentioned that in the end of the day, we need to be very clear. Are we doing a research experiment? Are we trying to do operational um, um, application delivery? We are not going to solve societal issues using AI. Uh, that, in the end of the day, is society. So I've seen a lot of initiatives, and don't get me wrong, it's, it's commendable work and needs to continue, mm -hmm. where we're looking at AI to really solve things of the kind of the, the negative type of biases and so, so forth that we're trying to address. My personal view, I'm happy to hear otherwise, is that AI is not going to solve that. Um, it is for us to do it and that implication associated. And this mm -hmm. is kind of where I meant it by the point of, if you already know of a certain objective or outcome, I remember in my previous role, I was working with an insurance company mm -hmm. and they said to me, David, we believe that from a premium uh, 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 payment point of view, uh, there has to be inequality or equity with respect to gender. So my question to them was, why are you then using AI? If you already know that that's the outcome, you know how much you want to make, it's uh, literally, I can write down the mathematical equation to reverse engineer how you should do the calculation effectively. So AI is a tool. We need to make sure we're not running around looking for, you know, the hammer, looking for everything that presumably looks like a, a nail. And that is one very critical component of making sure we're effectively using AI in the region, deriving the value that we're interested in and mitigating any potential harm that we all collectively want to mitigate. Thank you for adding that on. Um, anyone else has anything to add to this uh, theme of conversation before we move on to the next thing? No. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. So I think uh, one of the audience members is interested to learn more about how AI is being used to fight fraud and um, you know just the bad actors in general. Um, I'll open this question up to anyone in the member of the panelists. But uh, for those in the audience who would like to ask questions, please do uh, try to direct it to a specific speaker you have in mind. Uh, but for now, would anyone like to take this question? Uh, I'm happy to jump in. Just continue. Sure. This is a very close. This is a very close to heart topic. Um, uh, okay, go the, ahead. The, the answer, because I, I see the way the, the question was phrased, is hope we can. Uh, the answer is we must. <laughs> uh, from my point of view. Uh, and the reason for that is exactly like we've been discussing on terms of identifying risk and credit scoring marketing, mm. hyper-personalization, in end of the day, AI, if you deliberately oversimplify to its most rudimentary terms, is about identifying patterns or identifying the irregularity in patterns, whether it is in terms of the ability to repay or the likelihood of fraud. So there, there are wonderful solutions out there, but a lot of times you find that they're domain-driven, which is very critical, rule-based associated. Those will not, not change. They will still be there. The way AI models can really come and help is identifying the subtlety of the irregularities or patterns of the type of fraudulent or you know bad actor type of activities that we're trying to mitigate. So, so, so the answer is we must <laughs> use it. Absolutely, thanks for that, David. Um, Ishan, Aninja, Jerry, anyone else would like? Can, yeah, can, yes, can, go ahead. Can, uh, uh, so you know, so again, uh, taking from because we we. I mean, we are we are being used in 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 fraud detection in I don't know, fifty fintechs, right? So, very practically, right? Very practically, again, I'll go back to something that Ishan said. You know, AI is used in you know, throughout the lending life cycle, and the objective of using AI in lending for fraud is to figure out what is predictive that somebody is going to commit fraud, right? So, and 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 the actual application of AI is is you know, it's like a you know, I used to teach. Uh, grad and undergrad AI class in Georgia Tech at one time. This is before I went to the dark side. So it's like, it's, it's take the data, see who's committed fraud, who hasn't, and see patterns that, that. so I, I don't know how much I can say here. You know, so, so there are very distinct, you know, there are 13, 14, 15 different things that, that are easily observable that end up indicating that there is a risk of fraud in, in, in that specific, you know, and, and, and of course you can, you can go and you can identify fraud at many stages, right? You can ident try to identify fraud when somebody's applying. So how likely is this a fraudulent application? You can, you can look for fraud at other stages, you know, so I'll give you a couple of examples. So for instance, some, one of the things that, that we have seen from, 
many, many of these is that one of the most common common sources of fraud is uh, reporting where you live, right? The, 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 the locations that, that you report. And if you are, if you are not truthful, right? Uh, there is a significantly high chance, higher chance more than if you didn't, that, that, that you might be up to something no good, right? So there are, I mean, this is, I can say this super generic, but there are, you know, there are, and, and now now AI in lending or AI in, in finance has been around for a while. So that there are, you know, I'm sure, you know, Ishan or, or, or David, I mean, they, you know, there are a bunch of things. Now, what where, where it becomes interesting is that, you know, where, you know, from mobile wallet's perspective, so there's certain things that, that people know lead to fraud. But in many cases, when you are operating in the environment where we are talking about, which is, you know, no little data, uh, you know, emerging market, some of those markers might be uncomputable, right? Some of those markers might not be resolvable. So, so uh, the work, at least, at least our work has been, are there alternate markers that, that can be used based on information that you can readily observe? that can act as well, right? So that's, that's, that's been at least one of the focuses of, of fraud detection in lending. Thank you for those examples. Um, anyone else? Jerry, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think, I think Anit said a very good point is, is more mm. than rely on purely single AI model, right? Um, so, so the example that I talk about the, the document authentication, um, obviously, Government rolling out new 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 ID document with with uh, security feature where we train AI to do it. But at the same time, we also seeing is that AI will not be perfect, and 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 that's exactly where we actually employ what we call multi layer approach of uh, authentication. And 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 uh, some good example is that we we use device uh, 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 um, fingerprint uh, uh, technology where where we actually uh, have our um, uh, iOvation solution that really covers six billion devices globally, where we actually have other customer of the same devices uh, understand their behavior, and we also start to look at things like um, behavioral analytics through the device to really collect um, the online measurement of behavior of how likelihood on 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 in terms of in, uh, the the needs of lending, as well as part of creating part of the credit uh, lending decision. And whether there's actually demonstration of um, fraud behavior around it, again, this this will be coming part of the decision matrix that needs to be done. Uh, whether we will use a use AI to do a decision matrix, I think that is a couple of the next step we we need to do. But what we want to do is make sure we protect and do it properly so that we can operate uh, safely, right, uh, in, in doing lending, and and do responsible lending. And, and that's ex ex exactly where the, 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 what TransUnion is trying to do is, is really make use of our data, whether it's from a phone verification, address verification, or e even income verification, right? How we can make use of our data to support part of the process so that we, through the authentication, becoming um, a, a multi-layer way to, to ensure a proper lending can be done and, and in, 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 in as seamlessly as possible, right? Thanks okay. for that, Jerry. Uh, Ishan, do you have something to add as well? Yeah. Um, so, Go ahead. Yeah. So I think fraud detection uh, will the the way you solve for fraud detection will will change depending upon the scale of the data you're dealing with uh, and the complexity of the use case. Uh, so if you're if you're at fairly low scale and you know maybe things like okay you're you're processing a fairly low number of applications. Uh, you can employ manual methods of fraud detection, you know, across like, let's say documents, or you can have some sort of, you know, you graduate one more step, you start looking at rule sets that, okay, a transaction is happening, uh, a particular, let's say a credit card transaction is happening uh, at a certain hour in the day where it's unusually, uh, it's unusual where the transaction doesn't happen, right? So you start looking at it as an anomaly detection problem, right? And at scale, it is what like fraud is essentially a anomaly detection problem. Um, the problem, I think, I, I I would go back to what David said, right? Like we we must use AI for this problem because at scale, uh, 
finding fraud is a very nuanced problem. So like, for instance, Jerry mentioned uh, behavioral analytics, right? So if we are collecting data on how a person is filling up an application, right? Like how, like what's their sort of speed of typing, pattern of typing, you know, how long did they take to complete an application? There's no way that we, we can actually detect uh, fraud other than AI on, on, a, on this kind of a problem, right? So I think it, it starts with manual, then rule set, and then has to be AI. And it also depends upon the kind of scale and the, uh, the use case that you're dealing with. Well, you know, Dave, if it's all manual, then it's going to be an insanely large workforce, right? <laughs> but yeah, thanks, thanks okay. for uh, giving us insights on that. Um, I think one of the things that were brought up earlier were about new business models, BNPL, which is uh, getting increasingly popular nowadays in Southeast Asia as well, right? Um, maybe we can uh, get some insights on this. Aninya, if you are working with any uh, BNPL companies, do you have any insights on what kind of data they use for credit decisioning over at BNPL companies? Your mic is uh, muted, by the way. You might want to... Yes, you set, me up. Yeah, you set me up. You know that we work with a ton of BNPL. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah. So, um, look, uh, at the end, uh, you know, it's... it's, it's I mean, there, there are a few things that at least our experience indicates right so so um and that is that is across virtually every company we work with both here and in latin america that that when you build a predictive model uh the bigger contributor to the model is usually uh, the features that anchor the model right um not not the learning technique you used to so we've almost always seen that a super cool you know Reinforcement learning used with crappy data is almost going to get beat by, you know, I don't know, pick something up, linear regression with good data. Okay. Um, so, so, so in general, it's, it's, it's sort of, you know, and, and something that Ishan brought up also plays in here is that explainability becomes so important. And especially in the finance case, because, you know, you're talking about people's lives here, right? So you just, you just say, Hey, okay, I decline you or that's it. I mean, it's, it's good to give, or, you know, explanations. And most of the most advanced techniques are black boxes, right? So, so they don't, they don't let you know sort of why they did what they did. So often simple techniques work better because they, you know, offer, you know, mathematical models, weights, blah, blah. So in general, most, most of our, you know, uh, I mean, uh, if there's nobody from India, so you, I could, you know, whether you talk about Paytm in India or Bharat Pay in India, you know, the, the, the large, large, you know, so we've always seen that simple models anchored by good data is what, what you typically want to, want to perform. For the credit decisioning, Vincent, uh, yeah, so, so, so if you don't have, uh, you know, usually we, we operate in environments where there's just not a lot of data. So, you know, there, no, no, there are some very interesting things that end up being predictive of credit score, right? So, for instance, uh, you know, we were talking about fraud. I'll give you another example of fraud, which is very generic. Your mobility, we have found, over and over again, becomes quite predictive of fraud, right? And it's very, the relation is very interesting. So let's say I, I create, you know, we create this measure of mobility called radius of gyration in mobile wall. I forget the math. But assume that you know how much a person moves, okay? So it turns out that up to a certain point, uh, mobility is, is, is inversely correlated with risk in the sense that if you move a little bit more, you are more likely to pay back the loan. But there is an apex after which if you're more mobile, you are more risky. Okay. So we have seen this over and, you know, so, so, so there are a lot of clients who get this radius of gyration parameter to put in there, you know, in credit decisioning, you know, uh, affluence, you know, simple thing like affluence is such an important, but affluence proxy, affluence proxies are very difficult to do. You know, so we have, you know, so we have seen proxies like, you know, what's the average value of the handset in your household? Becomes, becomes a fairly strong predictor of your credit risk, right? And there are also nuances there. For instance, Indonesia, it's the average value of the handset in your household. But in a country like India, where the social gap in the people who live in the household is larger, average is no longer a good indicator, max handset value, right? So there are, you know, it's all about, at least, at least for us, 
the problem solving part, what has been most interesting is these, and, and, and I don't want to go and talk about all that, but I just give you some ideas. But there are things that you can create that end up end up uh, end up predictive of, of of what what you know, and, and you can use them in every not just credit decisioning, right? When you're when you're acquiring a customer, why acquire somebody who's likely to default, right? Mm -hmm. So can I, can I can I skew? Can I impact my acquisition process to preferentially acquire people who are less likely to default, right? I mean that mm -hmm. that I'm talking about NPL that. So those are, you know, there are many ways that people are doing that. But, you know, I just want to give you a flavor of some of the stuff that, mm. that happens. But, but one of the most things, one of the coolest findings, and I did not expect this when I started, you know, having worked with probably, I don't know, 50 BNPL companies across, mm. the simple technique with good features is almost always better than a complex sort of whiz-bang technique uh, mm. uh you know, not anchored by good features so so mm. that's that uh, that's what I've, i'll i'll say mm. the mobility and the as apex uh aspect of it is something that's interesting i, I didn't realize that's also uh, something that could be used as a measure of uh, credit worthiness so that's quite interesting um and and david you know earlier you spoke about responsible lending right and we have seen some cases perhaps overseas where there is a lot of <laughs> that particularly within the younger generation in the usage of bnpl so in in, in your opinion um are bnpl companies using the right parameters in in determining uh who, who to give credit to from from your viewpoint well look uh... For the vast majority of BNPL, it's 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 and actually it's been a bit of a existential question because actually I've been involved yeah. with one, is that it's 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 nothing, it's credit card. It's yeah. it's from that perspective. The the question yeah. now is the bar, and you've seen already credit cards mm. coming out, which are you know controlled by parents for kids. Heck, they're you know planning to replace in a lot of schools cash with with effectively a form of a wallet. So it's happening now. Is that responsible? As a parent, personally, I think vehemently no. <laughs> you want kids to actually <laughs> touch money so they have an ability to count it. But that's that's a different debate. Um, I think it's really more of a question of what is it acceptable, number one. Mm. This is where I'm not trying to pass the buck, but I think it is the responsibility of the regulator. I mean, that's effectively the reason they exist, where they need to mm. essentially do that sense-making of saying, it's less of a case of what's right or wrong, but what is, what, and every geography will be different. What is it that we want? What is it that we allow? And then thirdly, and this is where I do think is the responsibility of the operator, is transparency. You know, it's, it's not a case of, uh, you know, uh, and especially when we're dealing with the digital lens. I mean, if you think about the, the, the non-digital world, like even lending and loans or credit card, you would get asked a very simple question from the relationship manager or the agent of, do you understand what I'm what I'm describing? And it's that confirmation. You may still not understand, and you just say yes. But at least you have that ability of asking questions back and forth, T's and C's. Now it is where it's a click this button. How many people truly, truly, truly read through things or, uh, or understand the aspect? I don't know. So that's where there is a criticality of moving away from the analog world with legalese and you know pretty in the front and there's tons of, of, of documentation behind it to putting it up front, very simple terms and very transparent, honesty. Yes, some may walk away, but many would not, but at least you're creating this trust aspect from the digitalization uh, point of view. So I think it's these three pillars that need to come into play and all have to change. Transparency, making it a, a lot more vehement, a lot more uh, um, um, trend, uh, well, representative, the responsibility um, in terms of, like I mentioned, from, from the regulator, there is a need of becoming a lot more proactive rather than reactive. I mean, like, look at the crypto thing. Now it's like, oh, uh, regulator saying like, oh, we need to do that. Like, yes, the sun rises in the morning. Um, <laughs> and then the final one, as I mentioned, in terms of really kind of really understanding and making an analogy with respect. And let's go back to the segments of, you know, putting those premises in place of are, are we kind of providing those products, which actually not that different, it's just a different form effectively. Thanks, Ada, David. Um, we've unfortunately run short of time. I have so many more questions and there's so many more questions from the audience as well. Um, but maybe we can move on to 
closing thoughts. But before we do that, does anyone else want to add anything about this uh, conversation about BNPL? Yeah, just just a very quick one. Sure, um, Jerry. We we actually done a, a quite extensive study in different market on BNPL and how they're needing credit data. Uh, one thing we find is obviously the the BNPL actually is actually promoting more what we call younger generation and 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 the need of credit, uh, especially those don't have credit before. So this new some of them are new to credit and 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 actually help them to build up their credit score uh, mm. on that. So, so actually that's an improvement of, of using it. The key question is more about how is some of these BNPL because those are very frequent transaction and and mm. and normally real time. Uh, in the traditional world of credit bureau is is normally a, a monthly uh, checking on, on on credit data, right? So this is where we actually becoming one of the new thing that we actually try to adopt of how do we support real time data contribution? How do we support real time inquiry and then facilitate it for BNPL so that they can actually understand the affordability of the consumer. So so these are some of the, the very uh, emerging, evolving new development in, in bureau space. And, and obviously, um, the, the use of AI, I think, may be also a way to, to, to compensate on it. But I think I think that that's uh, some of the development that we're working. Let me share with you um, a, a link on um, the, the study uh, that, that we actually done in, in, in different market. And then you can actually take a look at it and whether you want to share with the group um, on BNPL. Sure. If it's uh, yeah. something relevant, we can definitely include it in the summary article for everyone to study a little bit further as well. Um, I think it's interesting, of course, if you use responsibly, uh, this BNPL data could be a solution to some of the data blind spots when we have, uh, that we have in credit decisioning, right? Thanks for that uh, insight, Jerry. Um, so let's move on to closing thoughts. Maybe we can start with uh, Ishan. Do share with us what are your closing thoughts and uh, maybe this one question here as well by Samuel. Um, if you have a book recommendation for AI related subjects. Okay, so maybe I'll start with some closing thoughts. Sure. Uh, I mean, first of all, thanks everyone. I think it was a really good discussion. I definitely got to learn uh, new stuff uh, from all of the folks on the panel. Um, I think the broadly the idea is that at in today's world and especially like you know in the next uh, three to five years uh, if you're in this in a fintech uh, space and and you know doing lending in any shape and form whether it's buy now pay later credit cards mortgage mm -hmm. uh, sme lending i think ai is going to be super super essential uh, not just in credit scoring but across the board uh, and also, I think maybe one thing I'll also add is like AI itself is very evolving really, really fast, uh, where a lot of the stuff that wasn't possible is now getting possible, right? So mm. we're talking about lending, but even uh, even in the aspect of just writing code, like AI is able to help you now. So mm. I'm really, really excited about like the next five years of you know what AI will enable, uh, in addition to like you know what what we've already discussed today, mm. I mean, it's something uh, fascinating, right? If you look at outside lending as well, the development is really at an insane pace. And you know, five years ago, it just seems like what we're doing now is a little bit of fiction, but today is reality. So it's pretty cool stuff, right? You have any uh, book recommendation for our audience? Uh, for AI, yeah, let me think about it and and drop it in the chat. <laughs> Sure, no worries. Uh, let's uh, move on to David and then Aninya and then Jerry. David, uh, closing thoughts and recommendations. Um, well, I'll, I'll try and keep it brief. As we shouldn't stop the potentiality, the potential of what we can do. The actually, I don't like using the term financial inclusion. I, I much rather use mm. financial resilience. Um, mm -hmm. Because that's what really what we're trying to establish. It's not just you know, it's, what's that saying? You know, uh, teach a man to fish versus just give him give him give him a fish. So it's really about res resilience that we want to establish in the system. And across the entire board, this is what provides. That's one. Two, we have to use data. I mean, the world has gone digital. Da digital by definition means data, mm -hmm. and it opens up those underlying possibilities. Having said that, we need to be smart about it. We need to understand the technical nitty-gritty you know um, 
specificities on what it can and can't do. And we need to look at it on a broader sense in an organization, in an organization, in a process, in a society, and having that underlying balance. Again, just because we have a, we have a good tool doesn't mean it applies to everything. I think it applies to many things. But it doesn't mean we have to apply to everything. And we need to find that balance. And that will also evolve and change with time. But the long and short of it is that we have to continue. There will be mistakes along the way. But because we are all very kind of putting up our governance approaches, we're all thinking about it, we're all reviewing it, it's fiduciary responsibility, is we need to learn from them and continuously improve. Okay. Cool. Thank you for your nuggets of wisdom and always, you know, interesting analogies and insights shared. Uh, always a pleasure to have you, David. Moving on to uh, Aninya, what, what are some closing thoughts or maybe even a book recommendation you have for our audience today? Uh, David, David got spared on the book recommendation part. Oh yeah, David. Any any recommendations or <laughs> <laughs> B- book recommendations? Ah. Uh... Well, actually, the, the, the book recommendation that's kind of stuck in my head, which has nothing to do with it, is that, was it five or seven uh, traits of a dysfunctional team? I think that's a brilliant book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, David. Uh, and yeah, moving back to you. Yeah, so it, the book recommendation is a little bit easier for me because of the framework I come from. So, mm. you know, so um, AI in finance is now, you know, so books is fine, but AI in finance is now virtually every university you know, if you you know there is a joint course between computer science and business school that is ai and finance like i actually taught this course once in nus uh, i think ntu you know because singapore ntu has a course georgia tech where i taught for a long time or taught for some mm-hmm. time you know, has a department called risk right and they teach ai and finance so so i'm sure uh, if you go to your local university and as long as they have you know, a computer science department, a business school, I'm sure you can find. And, and, and I can give you, it's easy for me because in my class, I recommended, you know, that it was not a must buy book, but I recommend it because I always, you know, I'm a big O'Reilly fan. I mean, from, from, from since I was, a, in, O'Reilly has a, I, I'm sure, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure I remember AI and finance book, which was, which was not bad. I mean, it, it talks about many of the things that we have spoken. Closing thoughts, Vincent. I, yeah, I mean, I think, I think the panelists have done, you know, we have gone through a whole bunch of issues. Mm. Uh, you know, I am so so so. If you leave aside, hey, is AI good for finance? Is AI used in finance? I mean, that's those are all interesting. So, what's interesting for me as an entrepreneur is how does it work? You know, do the BNPL companies themselves do AI? I mean, they're going to do AI for sure. But where does the AI heavy hitting happen, right? Or mm. do companies like Mobile Walla? create a, a, a AI framework and AI actually goes quite, you know, uh, Ishan will probably appreciate this. You know, we keep talking about, you know, there, there are lots and lots of, you know, for instance, uh, 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 AI in credit risk is particularly data intensive, right? So, so doing things like EDA becomes a huge problem uh, and, and, and practical problem because you end up wasting a lot of money on cloud, you know, doing, doing you know, so, so things like, you know, so what, what, what I've been thinking of is, can you make that less expensive? Can you create pipelines that mm. people can use, right? So there are lots and lots of the, the early kind of adoption phase. Then lots and lots of operational uh, kind of innovations that I think hopefully Mobile Walla will be part of them in, 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 you know, going beyond that, hey, here's this cool data set, use it, generate, you know, here, here are tools that can make that entire pipeline simpler and easier and cheaper, uh, build, help you build models that are more resilient and so on and so forth, right? So those are operational issues are, 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 are very close to my heart. Thank you, Aninia. As always, it's a pleasure to have you and your insights, deep diving into specific data modeling and data-related insights. Really appreciate it. And Ishan has uh, shared a book as well. Um, it's called AI Superpowers by Kai Fu Lee. I've not personally read his book, but I've heard him speak multiple times. I'm sure it's a really good book to uh, catch up with you and learn more about AI. Uh, last but not least, Jerry, um, any closing thoughts, any book recommendations for our audience today? Yeah, I think um, in terms of, uh, I think it's a very good sharing, I think, in, in this session. I think I, I think um, especially on the whole uh, response for lending. And, and mm. I, I think also we, we hear some of the challenge in terms of lending um, 
uh, for individual lender that they may have, may have enough data to support AI, right? I think that is where um, one thing that we actually look at from bureau point of view is that we, we are creating solutions, uh, not just on a purely on the credit data, but also from KYC that we collect data for that could support AI, right? I think that is where we actually start looking at the same device being hit for fraud, right? We can actually apply for multiple vendor because we gather more data to support the AI decisioning, right? I think that's where we, we would want to see how do we lower the cost of AI uh, in the entire credit life cycle, right? Whether it's from a prospecting, uh, uh, underwriting, or even collection or monitoring pur purposes. So I think these are the direction that we're moving into. And 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 I, I do think that that AI will will definitely be become part of the the standard process for for most of the lender anyway. But I think it's more about how to apply and how to actually do it right. I think that that is where where we will be going at. Um, I, I don't have any particular books uh, at this point, but I'll, I'll drop you anything that I'll, I'll find interesting uh, afterward. Thanks. Sure, Jerry. I appreciate your thoughts. Uh, once again, thank you everyone for tuning in for the entire hour. That's over 100 of you. I really enjoyed this session because I think we've got a really diverse view from a credit bureau, a fintech lender, a banker, and also a data solution provider as well. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the session as much as I did and hope to see you guys again soon. Thank you and bye-bye. Uh, Thank you, Vincent. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks all. Thank you.